Welcome to Windy Night Stories. Tonight's story is by Genevieve Thorndike Clark. A Message from Beyond. Chester Harland and I were classmates in college, and as different in character as disposition as fast friends often are. Harland had a provoking way of winning all the prizes and walking off with all the honors, as it appeared by sheer good luck, for he was never known to study. Indeed, I never knew Harlan to exert himself in a given direction a sufficient length of time to justify the smallest portion of the success greeting all the undertakings with which he was identified. His championship of a cause seemed to have a talismanic quality, the potency of which none ventured to dispute. How far the prestige of three or four successive triumphs may have unconsciously strengthened a species of suggestion reacting upon him in full telepathic force, was a matter which we did not then take into account. Had he been less than he was, brilliant yet unassuming, and a thoroughly good fellow withal, there might have been occasion for that sort of jealousy which has disabled many a good contestant in life's race. Harland was, in fact, so manifestly beyond our ken, that we yielded to his various successes, wonderingly at first, but later as a matter of course. He took no credit to himself, alleging that in all things he displayed a particular aptitude were the result of inspiration, and attributing the mystery to some occult power, in the investigation of which he was all too actively engaged. It is given to friends to see the weaknesses of friends and to be forewarned of pitfalls surrounding one naturally so gifted and lovable as Chester, and I, a serious, plodding medical student, found myself quite unwillingly analyzing certain of his qualities which, while desirable in a gentleman, might be a hindrance to him as a man. It required a great deal of urging on his part to induce me to attempt psychic investigation with him, for, while I was prone to accept the phenomena, I had a distinct repugnance to their being assigned any apparently supernormal cause. None are free from that weird and often entirely latent suggestion of what is possibly true, and, while I was aggressively indisposed to believe in communications with spirits of the dead, there was a subjective admission, unconscious yet potent, as I know now, of the possibility that the soul, freed from its mortal coil, might still exist as an entity striving to establish with friends still in the flesh a relation which, in the present state of spiritual evolution on earth, apparently leads nowhere. Not only was solution hedged about with the intangible to such an extent as to preclude the possibility of obtaining major or minor premise, and unexplainable in view of that settled law and order with which the dead have never been known to interfere, but it was abhorrent to me to contemplate those I had loved and lost, moving as silent astral bodies, unperceived but perceiving, unknown but knowing, specters fenced about with limitations more inexplicable because to them the mystery of death stood revealed. The process of the soul's evolution might be continuing, according to natural laws, in the disembodied, following out the order by which our fleshy habitation crumbles, to become part of the earth of the economy of which nothing is lost, and that the ghostly visitant might be undergoing experiences as fraught with doubt and fear as my own, did not once occur to me. Theology had fixed in my mind the belief that existence after death necessarily involved the solution of earth's problems at one fell swoop that if the dead wished to convey a message to me, they would be limited by my own incapacity to comply with conditions necessary to that end, did not appeal to me as evident. Gibbon, in his Decline and Fall, illustrates an analogous instance. Christian geography was forcibly extracted by texts of Scripture, and the study of nature was the surest symptom of an unbelieving mind. The orthodox faith confined the habitable world to one temperate zone and represented the earth as an oblong surface, 400 days' journey in length, 200 in breadth, encompassed by the ocean, and covered by the solid crystal of the firmament. So-called Christianity had engendered certain prejudices and had led me to accept half-truths which not only blinded me to life's true meaning, since the lessons learned in childhood are never forgotten, but made it exceedingly difficult to accept nature's law as the most satisfactory study, that undeviating law which runs alike through physical and astral state, and which, though possibly taking new forms, 
exists as one harmonious whole throughout the innumerable worlds of the universe. Harland and Miss Annette Wilson, to whom he was betrothed, accompanied me to the first spiritualistic seance I ever attended. Annette was a bright, enthusiastic, earnest girl to whom life was an unopened book. Both of poetical temperament, they were mutually as profoundly attached as any lovers I ever knew. The misgivings I had as to their fitness for each other had reference rather to the similarity than to the peculiarity of their temperaments. Their mutual interest in occultism was a bond of sympathy the importance of which might easily be exaggerated. It was impossible to disbelieve in that, when she declared that by an effort of will she was able to follow Chester's movements when absent, for she was truth itself. But it occurred to me that this transcendent ability to see indefinitely into space and through brick walls might possibly have its disadvantages on the uncertain sea of matrimony. She was as anxious as Chester that I should be convinced of the truths of psychic phenomena, and it was largely through her wish that I at last consented to attend a seance. It was my theory that the messages purporting to come from the dead had their origin in a method of thought transference, the workings of which were equally mysterious to the medium and to the sitter, that there was no well-authenticated instance of information being conveyed, which might not have had its source in the subconscious suggestion of the latter. I felt, therefore, that I approved my case when, submitting to the medium a single-test question, among many casual questions the answers to which amounted to little or nothing, I received no satisfaction whatever from the spirit world. Leaving the house three-quarters of an hour later, and immediately restating my theory to Chester, he turned on me with a sour smile. You are satisfied, Fred, quite naturally. You went into that room confident that you could hypnotize the medium. Not remaining passive in compliance with the conditions, you gave the suggestion that the medium could not answer that question. As I said just now, you went for fraud, and that's what you got. If a man gets what he goes after in this world, he ought to be satisfied. I laughed, not disliking to see him nettled or to think that his faith might be shaken. You admit, then, that the basis of the mystery is in suggestion, I cried, thinking to gain the first proposition for a syllogism. As he turned his head away impatiently, Annette leaned toward me. You miss the point, Fred. The medium never promises satisfactory sittings, unless the subject consents to remain passive. That, you admit, you did not do. I do not understand the essence of the conditions any more than I am able to reason why the positive and negative poles are necessary to generate an electric current, or any more than I can explain what was always a great mystery to my parents, namely, the fact that I could dance almost as soon as I could walk, and that, too, without any instruction, and, so far as any of the family knew, without ever having witnessed dancing in any form. We cannot understand these things. It seems to me, however, that since human beings have lived for thousands of years on this earth ignorant of physical forces in the very atmosphere, it is just possible that a few mysteries might yet remain unsolved. No, I cannot see that you have proved anything. I had, however, satisfied myself. Less than two years after this, Harland and Annette were married, Chester having in the meantime qualified as a lecturer on scientific subjects. When I inquired quizzically whether he included parapsychology in the exact sciences, he became profoundly serious and was on the point of admitting that he did. His health giving out that winter, he came for me to treatment. This surprised me, as I had supposed that his leanings were toward Christian science. He was quite a reasonable patient, and during his convalescence, he was suffering from an incipient nervous disorder, we enjoyed together many pleasant readings and mental rambles. I was amazed and, I need not say, alarmed that he persisted in assigning his brilliant platform utterances to an extraneous influence. The gradations by which he had arrived at this belief were by no means so illogical to my mind as the belief itself, and I soon discovered that, given a premise, he was able to reason with acumen to any absurd conclusion, yet that, Having accepted a conclusion, he was quite unable to go back of it into the broad field of generalization where he might compare premises. 
This process, indeed, would have necessitated a recognition of material attributes, which, from the very nature of his genius, Harlan could not appreciate. Owing his popularity and success to implicit obedience of intuition, and attuned by instinct and temperament to prejudice against objective reasoning, how could he recognize, as such, a forewarning that the physical would inevitably demand compensation for the neglect from which it suffered? Already I was beholding the effects of spiritual dissipation in Chester's deep-sunk eyes, his frantic impatience with detail, and his almost insane contempt for the necessities of the flesh. Opposed to my influence against this was the far more potent suggestion of Annette, who, herself straining to the same dizzy heights, could not serve as ballast to her husband's dangerous flight into the spiritual. Gradually, after Chester's recovery, I lost sight of them, though occasionally as the years went by, I heard of him as a brilliant but erratic orator, crowding immense auditoriums and commanding the highest prices, the spoiled darling of the ladies and the wonder of all the men. Our dissimilarity of tastes and interests tended continually to widen the distance, geographical and otherwise, which separated us and yet I did not intentionally lose track of him. Certain that such a career must end in disaster, it did not astonish me to hear that he promiscuously annulled contracts when it did not suit his pleasure to fulfill them, and was as a consequence mulked of heavy sums in lawsuits. At last I heard of him no more. In the zenith of his popularity, he was suddenly swallowed up in obscurity, and the pathetic aspect of his case was the indifference of that public which had followed him like a whining cur at his heels, constantly with the crumbs of praise he scattered, but which now only shrugged its shoulders and declared his day gone by. One evening, seven years from the last time I saw Chester, several friends of mine and myself occupied a box off the stage of one of the best-known theaters in this country. The play was A Night in Andalusia. The first act was somewhat of a farce, and as the second bade fair to be, I entered into a discussion with one of my companions concerning a coup d'etat in which it was rumored that the then governor of the state was concerned. Our thoughts were suddenly forced elsewhere when, in time to a furious drumbeat from behind the scenes, a laughing girl sprang lightly out upon the stage. Behind her came a young man in a green velvet, gilt-adorned jacket, with knee breeches fastened to his variegated hose with buckles that glistened in the light. The girl wore a fantastic costume of an Andalusian peasant, her slashed and spangled gown terminating below the knees in a gorgeous golden fringe. I looked and looked again, but could not satisfy myself. Where had I seen that woman's face before? Simultaneously, she saluted the audience with the rattle of her castanets, and it broke into applause which continued for some seconds, during which her partner in the dance that was to be struck an attitude, waiting while by some unfathomable expressiveness in her movements she suggested the heights of excitement and the depths of languor. They were enacting a pantomimic love drama. About him she swayed with merry eyes, eluding him at first, dipping her arms in the windings of the dance, the suppleness with which she controlled and brought into rhythm all parts of her body, contributing a dainty sensualism to the effect. Round to the center she moved, alluring, contradictory, tantalizing. Then forward again, he, as she glided near, scarcely touching the floor in a wild whirl about, and exhibiting by his postures in the alternative slowness or quickness of his step, the gradations from natural ardor to a pursuit covered by opposition. Then, before anyone had time to see whence they came, rainbow draperies were dipped into a one maze of color, through, around, and under which these lovers danced as if it were to madness. The effect was electrical. The audience stood up. The excitement continued, ladies leaning forward with quick, ingenious interest, then sinking back into their seats and shading their eyes. As the dance continued, there was an almost repulsive fascination in it. The end was one breathless tremoussement, the girl standing still, smiling, but panting for breath. The curtain was rung down amid applause which barely shook the rafters. It grew up again instantly with brilliant lights on the tableau. 
My God, Fred, I heard one of my friends say. And for the first time I was conscious that I was making my way out of the box. Your face is like a sheet. Are you ill? I waved him back. No, it is nothing. Let me alone for a few moments, can't you? I beg your pardon. Will you take my excuses to the rest? I will be back directly. I made my way to the green room. It was some moments before the boy to whom I had entrusted my card for delivery to the lady who had just been dancing. I felt I could not make use of the flippant nominate amen, which appeared on the program, returned to say I would be received. I was shocked at a nearer view of her, for, in youth and freshness at least, she had appeared in the dance the old Annette of my boyhood days. Now I saw leaning against a mantle, rouged and half besotted, a coarse picture of a wizened old woman. Annette, I exclaimed involuntarily, and stopped short. She still held my card, but bitter lines about her mouth and a hard look in her eyes were the only signs of any emotion evoked by a memory of me, that and the shattered glass at her feet. But my presence apparently overcame her, for the tears started suddenly to her eyes as she exclaimed, You care enough to come here to see me. Thank you. She held out her hand. Wait a moment. I've nearly finished here for tonight. I don't come on again until at the close. We might walk a little in the fresh air. This room is stifling. My God. Looking me up and down in anguished contemplation. You don't look a day older. And how Chester has changed. I had it in my mind to say, and how you have changed, but I did not, and followed her silently down a private exit from the stage into the street. Loungers gazed with lazy curiosity after us, the woman in fantastic costume, I in full dress, as we moved down a side street. We had walked without speaking what seemed a long time when suddenly she stopped before a stairway. No one will know you here. Leading the way up to the steps to a Chinese restaurant, and a moment later ordering tea of the celestial who approached us. The crowd doesn't come in until midnight. She brushed off our chairs with her handkerchief. Then we sat down. Chester's still living, Annette, I ventured, and you reduced to this. Oh, God alone knows where Chester is, she sighed, and I don't know as to being reduced. With as few words as possible, she told me that her husband, requiring stimulus as time went on in order to continue his work, had little by little fallen a victim to drugs. It had been necessary to confine him to an inebriate asylum. It was believed that he was incurable, though he had been twice released on the doctor's certificate that he had fully recovered. My fears, then, were well grounded. That career, so brilliant, which had wasted its energies in attempts to transcend the knowable, had been shattered ruthlessly in its early bloom. Do you remember, Fred? Annette's voice broke in bitterly on my reminiscences. How you talked to us that winter Chester was so ill? How vainly you endeavored to convince me that the path we had chosen was ruinous? Well, I have lived to be sure that you were right. After I realized it, I tried to hold Chester back. Half the misery in this world hinges on the possibility of a man's gaining by privilege, good luck, etc., what no one ought to have except through hard work. When a man is particularly favored by fortune, he is apt to think of himself a special exhibit of the Almighty, and exempt from the moral law and order, not less than from the physical. It was late in the day for me to mend matters, but I recognized that people living in this world must have something practical to keep them down so I took to dancing for a living. She laughed as if she traded in wit. But why, I cried, my heart going out to the hapless Harland, why such a dance as that? It's not worthy of you. Oh, Annette, you are his wife. I'm not so sure about it being unworthy of me, she retorted, coloring. I tried the other extreme and found I wasn't worthy of it. It is difficult to please some people. She cocked her head on one side and tried to look arch. But that foreign dance, how did you learn it? Instinct. She laughed, probably at the amazement on my face as she spoke Chester's favorite word. 
Seriously, no one told me how. I saw it done once or twice in Andalusia, and my feet knew right where to go the moment I stood up to try. Suddenly she spoke of Chester again, but in a different tone and with great tears rolling down her cheeks. She had not seen him for two years, though, on hearing six weeks previously that he had again been released from custody, she had written to him affectionately, bidding him to come to her. Shortly afterward I left her at the door of the theater, and, sending a message of apology to my friends within, hailed a cab and was driven home. The next few days marked the breaking out of an epidemic, in a quarter of the city where my practice was extensive. Returning home about midnight, some days after my encounter with Annette, I sank into an armchair near the fireplace, utterly exhausted but not intending to fall asleep. As the gas was turned low, however, it is probable that I was dozing when I was startled by a dazzling light shining with painful force upon my face. For a moment I was blinded by the glare, and, uncertain to what it might be attributed, shaded my eyes with my hand when, as if out of a cloud of yellowish-blue vapor, I saw Annette coming toward me. I held my breath and leaned forward while great beads of perspiration started out all over me. Annette, I exclaimed, springing up, for God's sake. Chester is on a ship coming across the ocean. I have seen him. She named the vessel. Meet him at the wharf next Wednesday. Tell him to return by the next steamer to our daughter, whom he has deserted in France. She was gone with the words. Cursing myself for a fool to allow my nerves to get into a condition where they might play me such tricks, I staggered to the gas jet and turned the light on at full blaze. Then I tried to reason myself into a state of mind where I could admit the vision to have been a hallucination. So determined was I to disbelieve the evidence of my senses in this instant that I had an uncomfortable shock next morning when, on taking up a newspaper, I saw announced in flaring headlines an account of Annette's tragic death. She had left the theater at eleven o'clock in a cab, which had collided with a streetcar. She had been thrown out and instantly killed. For days thereafter I was haunted with the suggestion that I must comply with the request conveyed in what I still doggedly persisted in calling a dream. But so at variance was a serious interpretation of it with all the experiences of my life, that I resisted until Wednesday morning, when, realizing that the ship was due at noon, I was seized with an unaccountable impulse to verify Chester's presence on it. I do not remember that I was at all startled or surprised to see him, four hours later, descend the gangplank, and this notwithstanding the fact that his appearance was so altered that ordinarily I should not have recognized him. He made his way straight through the throng and grasped my hand. Neither of us spoke, but I turned at last with blinded eyes to lead the way to my carriage. He seemed to take it as prearranged that he should follow the course of conduct laid out by me. Fred, he said that evening after dinner as we sat together before the fire in my library, you did not need to tell me that Annette was dead. I felt her presence near me the other night, unless I am going mad again, as perhaps I am. Nevertheless, I knew that she was dead. You used to say, Chester, that there is no death in the sense in which the term is commonly used. There was silence. I know I did. I know I did. But I have reached a point where I can't distinguish between glimpses of the life beyond and a fearful trickery of the mind. My cursed egotism ruined her life. She warned me. You warned me. Everybody warned me. I don't know now whether you are a man or a cloud. And it seems to me that there is nothing left of me but my hands. He rose suddenly and went about the room gesticulating frantically. Chester, I went over to him, placed a hand on his shoulder, and looked squarely into his eyes. Annette came to me the night she died. Slowly, with wide-open, startled eyes, he pushed me to arm's length. You, who never believed? Even I, she came to me. I am perfectly convinced of it. It is true, then, though you did not believe? Tell me now. It is not all a madman's fantasy. You saw her, and, and... He looked at me with strained, beseeching earnestness. Yes, I saw her. She told me to meet you at the ship. 
She said you were not to continue the journey you had in mind, but were to return by the next steamer to your daughter, whom you had deserted. He continued to look at me. Slowly his arms dropped to his side, and gradually, as he grew pale, that unnatural look died out of his eyes. I led him like a little child to a chair, into which he sank, covering his face with his hands. Soon he grew more calm. Fred, I thank you. My life has been a series of tragic mistakes. I felt that if there is nothing beyond, few things matter. If there is, I might still be able to fight my way better there. I suppose there is some wise reason why it is not to be. I intended to settle some matters here which would have secured my daughter a competence. Then, he wrung my hand, I proposed taking my life. The End